You know, something I find interesting about language is how the meaning of a word can morph and change over time. And sometimes their meanings can shift so much that the word actually comes to communicate the very opposite of its original meaning. Uh, let me give you a few examples. Did you know that the word nice, for example, used to mean silly or foolish? It was a term used to offend or tear somebody down. But today, when we say someone is nice, it's at the very least a mild compliment, right? Or I found this one interesting, the word guy. Yeah, the word guy is actually an eponym, which means it was the name of an actual person. It comes from Guy Fox, who was part of a failed attempt to blow up parliament in 1605. Because of him, the term guy came to refer to a frightful or scary person. But in the United States, it's come to refer to men in general. Hmm, <laughs> kind of a bummer if you think about it. Or did you know that the word bachelor? The word bachelor was originally used to describe a noble and honorable knight. Now, universities still use the word bachelor to describe their degrees, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science. Yet somewhere along the way, it also became the word for unmarried men. And today, well, the word is known for most noble and honorable TV show, The Bachelor. Okay, I, I hope you know I'm joking. <laughs> but jokes aside, there is another word that has lost much of its meaning and importance. And today we want to look at what this word really means. And that word is marriage. Marriage. You know, there are all sorts of different perspectives on marriage today. Some see marriage as a contract between two adults. Others believe marriage is meant to be a fairy tale, a romantic and majestic love story. And then there are others who believe that marriage is a thing of the past. It's outdated or just flat out impossible. The writers of scripture have quite a bit to say about marriage and they define it in no uncertain terms. From beginning to end, a specific definition of marriage remains constant. And that definition is this, marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. And so today we're gonna dig into what this actually means and hopefully emerge with a greater appreciation and a deeper conviction for what God intends for marriage to be. So today we're concluding our series called From This Day Forward that has been all about the love we long for. During this series, we've addressed three commitments that can really revolutionize your life and your relationships. In the first week, we talked about the first commitment, seek God. This is the most important commitment. It's all about putting God alone in the center of your life. Last week, we talked about the second commitment, and that is to share fun. And we reminded that if you don't have some fun in your marriage, one day you may not have a marriage. And so today we're gonna to talk about the third commitment, Stand firm, stand firm. But before we get into this commitment, I wanna take just a minute and I wanna address a few different groups of people who may be with us today. First to singles, if you choose to get married at some point in your life, you're gonna need this commitment. So I'm gonna challenge you to lean into this talk because it's better to know now what you're signing up for before you make the choice to get married. To those who have experienced divorce, if your marriage didn't make it, don't let yourself sink into guilt today. Let today be an opportunity to stand firm in your relationships from this day forward. Now, I also wanna clearly speak to those who may find themselves in an abusive relationship. Don't misunderstand this commitment. If you're being harmed or in any kind of danger, please don't stand firm. Get help and get away. And I want you to know that we are here for you if you need that kind of help. And then finally, to married couples, Many of you need this right now, or you will someday. Maybe you're in a tough spot in your marriage even as I speak and you feel like giving up. I wanna encourage you to lean into this talk. All right, let's start by turning to the best teacher on any subject, Jesus. What did he have to say about marriage? Well, at one point in his ministry, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, are trying to trick him into saying something wrong about marriage and divorce so they could condemn him. Of course, you know, Jesus is way smarter than all of those guys put together, so he doesn't fall for their trap. But in the middle of this discussion, Jesus says something about marriage that I think is crucial for us to understand. Here is what he says. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, when Jesus says, have you not read? 
It's a pretty big jab at the religious leaders because the scripture he's referring to is actually found in the very first pages of the Hebrew scriptures, what we know as the Old Testament. They should have known this. The writer of Genesis is referring to the very first couple, Adam and Eve, when he writes these words. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. What we see in Genesis here and what we see in Jesus' words is crucial to our understanding of marriage. The joining of a man and a woman is so profound that the joining creates a third reality, one fleshness, one fleshness. One fleshness means that a a husband and wife are, are mysteriously and miraculously bound together by mutually submitting their lives to one another in such a profound way that they become radically unified, something new, something intended to be forever together. Now, now to be clear, uh, every person you meet is a whole individual. Every one of them, no matter their relational status. But many of them are also one flesh with another whole individual in such a manner that in some mysterious way, a third reality is also present. And it's this mysterious reality of one fleshness that is at the heart of this understanding that marriage is a covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Now, what is a covenant? Well, a covenant is a permanent, unchanging relationship. A permanent, unchanging relationship. Our God is a covenantal God who makes relationships with his people that are permanent. In fact, the Hebrew word here that is translated as covenant is the word bereth. Bereth. Say that after me, okay? Bereth. And it literally means a cutting. I learned something this week. In the Old Testament, to establish a covenant, people would do something quite unusual. They would cut a bull in half, place the two halves on the ground. Then the two parties would walk through the space in between the two halves seven times to create a covenant. As they performed that ceremony, they would say, if I break my covenant, may what happened to this bull happen to me. (laughs) This is serious business. A covenant is a permanent mutual commitment. Now, one way I think to better understand this committed covenant is to compare it to a consumer contract, all right? A consumer contract is based on mutual distrust, mutual distrust. We draft contracts, why? Because we're afraid we might get ripped off by the other party. I mean, I'm reminded of this every time I sign the lease on my apartment. It's about 20 pages long now. It's a contract based on mutual distrust. But a committed covenant is based on mutual commitment. We enter into a covenant choosing to trust the good intentions of the other person. A consumer contract limits my responsibilities. It guarantees that I don't have to do anything more than what's written in the contract. Now, the other night, my landlord texted me asking if I would shovel the snow. You know my first thought? <laughs> that's not in the lease. That's not in the contract. I know, not very Christian of me. But you see, a committed covenant raises my responsibilities. It requires me to assume responsibility for someone else's well-being. A consumer contract raises my rights. It specifically spells out what I am entitled to. But a committed covenant surrenders my rights. At times, it will call me to sacrifice my interests for the sake of my partner. Now, maybe this will help, okay? Any pizza lovers? All right, tell you what, if you have access to the chat, tell us your favorite pizza. Mine? Well, I was raised in the south suburbs of Chicago, so I love Aurelio's Pizza. I mean, in my mind, it's the best in the city. All about the sauce. But I will tell you, if Aurelio's were to change the sauce, change the recipe, and I didn't like the taste anymore, I might choose to get my pizza from Malnati's. Sorry, (laughs) but my need to get good pizza is more important than my relationship with the restaurant. See, that is a consumer relationship. In contrast, uh, think about this. Uh, When my kids were little, If one of them was crying or being selfish and a pain in the neck, I couldn't say, this is disappointing. I'm going to trade you in for a nicer kid. Of course not. Maybe sometimes I thought that. Well, no, of course I didn't. And I would never do that. Why? Because the relationship between me and my child is about way more than how I happen to feel at any particular moment. Thank God, right? I mean, none of us would have kids beyond the age of two. (laughs) This is a covenant relationship. Now, now here's a hard truth. Think about this. Dating? Dating is more like a consumer relationship. I mean, when you're dating, you put your best foot forward. Guys, you put on deodorant for the first time. Ladies, you do 
Nothing at all because you always look fabulous. But why do we often feel so insecure on dating? Because either one could end it at any time. But you see, that's why marriage is such a big deal. You see, marriage is when we move from a consumer contract to a covenant commitment. And marriage involves that self-giving, mutually submitting mystery of one fleshness. Marriage is a covenant. And this covenant is a forever covenant. It's not something we can get out of on a whim. Now, when two become one, it's not meant to be undone. Uh, one of our community pastors, Mikkel, uh, shared a picture with me. And it's a picture of a tree from where she used to live in Greenville, North Carolina. But it's actually two trees. These two trees were planted so closely to each other that their roots and trunks have kind of grown together. Their branches are intertwined and they have literally become one. Now, you can see that they are still two distinct trees. If you could see this picture up close, the leaves at the top look more like pine needles, where the leaves on the bottom are kind of shiny and pointed. They have different fruit, different expressions of their treeness. But if you tried to separate these two trees, it would come at tremendous cost. Yeah, both trees would come away with significant hurt and damage. Uh, marriage is a lot like these two trees. Uh, we are distinct. We look different. But our lives are permanently woven together. This is meant to be forever. And if you're like me, maybe you're captivated by this forever nature and the romance of two trees intertwined, their fates linked together. But I also know... On a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, that's where things can get difficult. You know, Lisa, my wife and I, we've been married for over 30 years. Yeah, over 30 years. Uh, here we are on our wedding day, and uh, here we are just a few days ago. And you know what? We're a lot like those trees now. I mean, our lives are so enmeshed, intertwined, but we are still so different. Sometimes we celebrate our differences, and sometimes we suffer through our differences. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a procrastinator, okay? And sometimes my motto tends to be, hey, why do today what you can put off until tomorrow? Uh, Lisa, on the other hand, loves to get things done. She is tenacious about completing a task. So, for example, my idea of taking out the garbage is taking out the garbage. Her idea of taking out the garbage includes replacing the old garbage bag with a new one right away. And it drives her crazy when I don't. So, <laughs> we've had lots of great times. And some really hard ones, too. But, you know, it's that forever covenant that we made to each other and to God that helps us forge through the difficult days. That kind of leads me to my next thought. Marriage is not only a forever covenant. Marriage is also a daily covenant. A daily covenant. And you see, every day our actions build up our marriage to make it stronger or chip away at its foundation. The Apostle Paul describes the long-term effects of our actions as planting destructive seeds or planting eternal seeds. He writes this, A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, themselves, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, God and others, the Spirit will reap eternal life. Uh, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You see, if you plant seeds of destruction, the fruit of those seeds will be destruction. But if you plant eternal seeds, the results will be the life God so wants for you. And every day we make choices, don't we, about the kinds of seeds we plant in our marriage. What can some of the destructive seeds look like? Well, destructive seeds can be distraction. Distraction, yeah. There was a Huffington Post article that came out in which a group of divorce attorneys were asked how social media can tank a marriage. The most common answer they gave is that screen time often got in the way of FaceTime. And I mean real FaceTime. Sometimes those little devices in our hands distract us from giving our full attention to each other. Anybody else guilty? Another destructive seed can be comparison. Comparison. I mean, it can be so easy, right, to compare the blooper reel of your marriage to somebody else's highlight reel. And we all know social media exaggerates that one, right? And then there's broken trust another deadly seed. Trust is about as important as breathing for a healthy marriage. What we do and what we say either builds up or erodes trust. Early on in our marriage, Lisa and I, we had some friends who, when we were with them, they would just dig on each other almost every time we were together. And it was so painful. I mean, you could just see it tearing away at their trust in each other. If we sow destructive seeds, we'll likely reap destruction. 
But on the other hand, you see, if we plant eternal seeds, the fruit will be life-giving. What do eternal seeds look like? Well, I think it's things like serving one another. You know, being intentional about finding ways to make life a little easier for your spouse. Or prioritizing time together. You know, making sure your spouse knows they are the most important person in your life. And then forgiving one another. No marriage is perfect. There will be plenty of stuff that goes wrong. But forgiveness provides a path to move forward. It's so important that we understand that marriage is a daily covenant. And every day our actions build up our marriage to make it stronger or chip away at its foundation. Again, whoever sows to please their flesh themselves, right, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, God, and others, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And then don't forget the promise that comes with this warning. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If we don't give up, if we make a commitment to stand firm. I want to say something to those of you who are struggling in your marriage right now. I want to encourage you, don't give up. Do not give up. What you're going through is hard. It's really hard. It's super hard work. But if you stay the course and refuse to give up, you will reap a harvest. I have friends who've been married for a long, long time who tell me that there were entire years where they didn't even like each other. But they stuck with it. They went to counseling and came out on the other side more in love with each other than ever before. In fact, did you know that two out of three unhappily married adults who stay together and choose not to divorce or separate end up happily married five years later? Two out of three. Two out of three. And only one out of five people who divorce or separate find themselves happily remarried five years later. So maybe you're in an unhappy season right now. I want you to know things can get better. Things can get better. I've seen it happen. In fact, I want to share a story with you that I hope will be an encouragement to you. My name is Jessica Mazza, and this is my husband, Sean. We have two daughters, Haley and Rachel, and we've been married for 21 years. We met when we were a freshman in college, and we both worked at the same grocery store, and we were engaged two years later and married two years after that. We got married at 21, so we were really young and just kind of followed the patterns that we thought were supposed to make us happy. There always seemed to be a hole or a void uh, there that needed to be filled, and I think I filled it with trying to you know, get the next greatest and latest things. There was still the void there, though, so it just kept us searching for the next thing, which drew us further apart because we weren't finding it looking at each other, and so it caused almost a resentment. You know, eventually it turned into, we've tried everything else, and you know, all the things we should have done didn't do it, so it's gotta be you that's the wrong thing. I, I knew that uh, it, when I would drink that there were times where I couldn't stop. I would drink to excess to try and deal with the pain. Uh, and, you know, I, I knew that sometimes it made her angry, and you know, that's really how low our relationship had sunk to the point where I was doing things, I think, to intentionally sabotage the relationship. It was very unhealthy. We both used numbing techniques and, and kind of searching outside. If, it, if I wasn't finding what I thought I would, could find there, it was a temporary fix to see or to be with other men. It was typically where I was seeking approval and attention from other men, and that was um, something that I knew would hurt him as well, And but I didn't think he could give me that happiness that I was searching for, and you know, the temporary satisfaction of getting that approval and attention provided that for me, but it was also part of the downward spiral of, you know, beating myself up knowing it wasn't the right thing to do. When we were separated for a year, got back together, tried it again for a year, and then we decided that we didn't know how to fix this, that it, it needed the finality of divorce. Almost immediately after the divorce, uh, I began a search for, for God. I, I started going to church. While at church, I was introduced to some people who I would definitely consider mentors. One of those mentors introduced me to uh, the Alpha um, program, and uh, it was life-changing for, for me. It was um, an answer to a lot of questions that I had that I had been searching for for my whole life. I also was on a seeking journey to find God. We had started attending the same church. I had didn't know that Sean was going to Alpha, 
His course ended in January and I actually took the next session and he didn't know that I had done that either. And I found it just completely um, answering all of those things and teaching me that, that God forgave me for everything that I did and that I could forgive myself and I could start fresh and he wiped away that sin. I had noticed Sean over the weeks, you know, he would come to get the kids from my house and, and noticed our interactions had changed, the dynamic had changed. There was something that was different and I was feeling different. So I didn't know if it was me, but I, or just noticing something I hadn't noticed before. But I finally asked him, I initiated that and asked him if we should get dinner sometime and just talk. I realized that there was a life that wasn't about me, what I could do to make myself get ahead. It was about what can I do to serve um, Jessica? What can I do to serve the Lord? Having reconciled a few times, or at least attempting to, this this time was night and day. We There was no hesitation. The burden was lifted. He didn't need to fulfill that emptiness in me anymore. The way we communicated and interacted, everything changed. The way we were different people. And so seeing our relationship at that point, looking back, we couldn't even recognize who we were before and how we could have treated each other and ourselves the way that we did. Since getting back together, the, the girls were so excited, mm -hmm. obviously, when Sean moved back in the house and they were part of our second wedding. The second wedding was totally different than the first. It was completely based on God, surrounded by everyone who watched us go through this journey. Having gone through this, what I would say is that Forgiveness is real. Um, for me, it had to start with forgiving myself and also realizing that that Jesus had for, forgiven me, that God had forgiven me for um, the sins that I, had, that I had committed. When we went through this, people were shocked that we had the issues that we had. And so I think we have to be open and honest about the struggles that we're having and, and talk to somebody, find that safe environment that you can share that with and be supported through. To those of you who are struggling in your marriage right now, I want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't give up. Maybe you need to reach out for help, get counseling or mentoring or, or figure out some new rhythms to get back on track. But don't give up. Give God a chance to redeem what you have been through. You know, Scripture compares our relationship with Jesus to a marriage. The church, us, followers of Jesus are referred to as the bride of Christ, yeah, we are the bride and Jesus is the groom. And in the same way a marriage is a covenant of commitment that is never to be broken, Christ's covenant promise to love you and me will never be broken. So let me just say, no matter where you are right now, if you're happily married or unhappily married, if you're single, divorced, widowed, or remarried, I want you to know that you are loved by God. And to prove his love for you, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, who chose to go to the cross on your behalf because he would rather die than live without you. And when you follow him, his spirit comes to live inside of you to help you stand firm, even when you feel like giving up. So please, don't give up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for marriage. Thank you that it's a, a forever covenant, but that it's also a daily covenant. And God, we, we, we give our relationships to you and ask for your spirit to come inside of us Lord, so that we can love others the way you love us. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.